Well, this doesn't happen often, <laughs> but it happens happily. I want to say thank you to the Lord Mayor, to Dublin City Council, to Alison, to UNESCO, to everyone, both seen and unseen, who chose this book. It came as a, a big surprise. I was aware of it, but I never thought that it would come my way. It was very true, and it's still partially true. Women do have to take a bit of a back seat, and we know that. But we're fighters, we're fighters. We're also, I think one of the things uh, Alison just said that uh, lifted my heart, a perseverer. You know, it's easy to write one book, fairly easy, but it's the keeping going. Uh, my father loved horses, and if I had leisure and money, both of which I do not have, there's a wonderful couplet by Ogden Nash, which says, she would have lived her life in nonchalance and en souciance, but for earning her living, which was rather a new seance. <laughs> <laughs> but to say a few things related to today, on the way here with Declan Heaney, I thought, when he wasn't talking non-stop, <laughs> I thought, thank you, Declan, I thought of a Faulkner line, the past is never dead, it's not even past. And I thought of how I became, began to write this book over this trilogy over 60 years ago. And the past, Ireland was the, the womb of what T.S. Eliot sometimes called the dark fetus and is of all my work. But Dublin, and I hope County Clare in particular don't take this to heart, Dublin was where I got some literary education. And that literary education happened in a bookshop on the Quays in Bachelor's Walk, where for 4p, as I've said before in an interview, I bought a copy of Introducing James Joyce by T.S. Eliot. And far from finding James Joyce difficult, I thought, oh my God, this is something so accessible. Mm -hmm. I read the Christmas uh, dinner in Portrait of an Artist, and I knew I had found my education. Pete Seeger, in a wonderful folk song, talks about the shoals of herrings being his education. For me, James Joyce and his uh, successor, known in Ireland as Beckett the Blasphemer, <laughs> also taught me a great deal. But I felt at that time, and I think any woman would have felt it, that it was essential to live out of Ireland because of the nearness, both for better and for worse, of everyone. Of people looking, if you have to put the cliches, over my shoulder. I had to be free. So off I go with a husband and two children who were very keen on my writing what they called a novel, so that I'd get a bit of cash to buy them little foolish presents. And I was glad to leave, and yet a strange thing happened to me. It was when I sat down in a strange street in England, looking out at a miserable common with a little small stream compared with the fields and forts of County Clare, that I felt the loss, and I genuinely felt it. I felt the loss for what I had lost and for what I had decided to lose. I felt the freedom to write and the loss of that great emotional font. However, I think or hope I put it to some use by writing, because I wanted to write more than anything in the world. I still want to write more than anything in the world. And I found it, I didn't have to search. My books now take four years. That took three weeks. The landscape, the gates, the hasp on the gate, a donkey brain, two people fighting, men shouting after a fair day in Scariff and having pints outside because the fair was on the street and so on. That was both my inspiration, my, in some occasions, my fear, and also the thing 
but told me about Story. Little did I know that trouble would ensue. In fact, I thought I was writing in private. I was writing in private. The trouble came long before the real trouble, and it came in the form of a letter from a nun in our convent in Loch Grey, County Galway. And it said, we hear you have written a novel. We give credence an open mind. Well, that meant they didn't. <laughs> that meant that it was time I got the wind up. And then, by chance, I was sent anonymously, of course. Uh, the, oh, no, the book came out, and there's no need to go in for the things that happened. They had to happen. It was part of that time. It was part of history. It was part of my being a woman and a young woman. And it was what it was. And as I said earlier, out in the green room to a lady who interviewed me, Patrick Kavanagh, great poet that he was, was extremely jealous and said being banned and um, uh, uh, harangued and all the other words gave me a, a celebrity I would never have had. In fact, he was rather jealous of it. <laughs> I still love his poetry, but there we are. But a sheep farmer in Unclockorn, which is at Clifton, just outside, uh, well, Clifton, you all know Clifton, I love Clifton. Anyhow, this particular sheep farmer, in, uh, I don't know how he made it, no, this keeps falling off, uh, said, we ran that woman out of Ireland. <laughs> well, there's nothing like a statement like that to keep you going and to write the second book and the third book. <laughs> the fourth book. And the opinion in County Clare was that the second book, guess what, was a prayer book by compared with the first book. So you both win and lose all the time, but it's grits to the millstone, because if one is dedicated to whatever it be, then everything has to be taken on board, including but the praises coming later in life and I'm very glad of it. I would be a phony if I said, oh no, it means nothing to me. It means a huge amount to me, Lord Mayor. I want you to know that. Your birthright is your birthright. And I believe in mine and I don't like it taken from me or disputed by me. And the only way I have of showing it is in these few words I put down again and again. You have all mentioned, and it gives me great heart to hear it, that now young people, poor young people, they're all getting grouped in one batch. <laughs> it's like widowers. Young people will read uh, The Country Girls, and it's, I hope they will. And I hope they will for two reasons. There's the personal reason, and there's the more wider cosmic reason. I believe utterly in the greatness of language, the power of language, the humanity that language is capable of spreading between nations, between enemies, between all. Language is the last almost great thing, well, so is nature, left in the world. Language unites if it's great language. I don't want glib stuff. I don't want to read glib stuff. I want to read great stuff. And I want, as Yeats, and I say it to myself as much as to others, as Yeats said, Irish poets, learn your trade. We have to keep learning our trade all the time. And I want those young people, men and women, it used to be that only women read me under the covers with the flash lamp, all the cliches. <laughs> but I think men read me at the Abbey. We've had previews for the last few nights. Men have come and shaken my hand. None from unclock on yet, but it will happen. <laughs> so therefore, it is a homecoming today of a very unique and prominent and beautiful and good, good time for me. I thank everyone, including those I forgot to thank, Alison, and God bless you all. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.